um, is Joel Leibowitz. Joel was born in Czechoslovakia in 1930. After surviving Auschwitz, he came to the United States and was able to make a new life being educated at Brooklyn College and then at Syracuse University. After his PhD, he worked at Yale University with Lars Onsager, which was his, the place of his first faculty position. And ultimately, since 1977, he's been on the faculty at Rutgers University, currently as the George William Hill Professor of Mathematics and Physics. Joel's made extensive and wide-ranging contributions to statistical mechanics and mathematical physics in a whole range of topics, including phase transitions, thermodynamics, stability of matter, and non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. He's received numerous honors, including the Boltzmann Medal, the Poincaré Prize, the Volterra Medal, the Max Planck Medal, and others, and too many to mention in full. I should also mention Joel's many services to the scientific community and beyond. For many decades, he's been organizing very valuable conferences on statistical mechanics. He founded a prestigious and important journal in statistical mechanics. He was the head of the New York Academy of Sciences and has worked for human rights of scientists around the world. I've always admired his leadership, and I probably should add that he's also a good friend. His topic today will be stability and variability. Yeah, thank you very much, Ed, for this very nice introduction. It is truly uh, an honor and pleasure to participate in this celebration for Freeman Dyson. Uh, I first met Freeman more than 60 years ago, before he came to the Institute uh, as a full professor. Uh, my recollection is vague, but I do remember I was a first year graduate student at Syracuse University, and we had a visit from uh, Dube, who was a very well-known probabilist at Illinois. And then, uh, after talking in Syracuse, he went to give a talk at Cornell in Ithaca. So I remember driving in the car together with my thesis advisor, Peter Bergman, and also Dube to Ithaca. Now, after the seminar, for some reason, we were invited to Dyson's house for drinks. Uh, uh, not sure why exactly, but Dyson's connection with probability was at that time. Uh, but anyway, Dyson was a famous professor at Ithaca. And then after the drinks, we all went out for dinner to some Italian restaurant. And I remember Dyson paying for my dinner, which was a very <laughs> great uh, help, considering that a graduate assistant salary at that time, I think, was $1,500 per year. So even though prices were lower. Anyway, uh, I have been the recipient of many kindnesses from Freeman over the ensuing years, and I'm definitely a Dyson fan. Uh, but that doesn't mean I agree in everything with Freeman. <laughs> and I think he would be horrified if anybody agreed with him on everything. He would immediately find some place to change the thing in order to be uh, a little bit different. But whatever uh, disagreements uh, I have, these differences, uh, they are far outweighed by my admiration for Freeman as a scientist, humanist, and artist. And I use the adjective artist very deliberately because I think Freeman is a grand optimist of life. I mean, he sees the whole universe as a work of art. In fact, as a work of art under construction. So I will start my talk with, uh, so could you please show the first slide? Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, this is just um, uh, quoting Dyson, saying why I call Dyson an artist or a poet. It's, uh, this is from his book, Infinite in All Direction says, to me, the most astonishing fact in the universe is the power of mind which drives my fingers as I write these words. Somehow, by natural processes, still mysterious, a million butterfly brains working together in a human skull 
have the power to dream, to calculate, to translate thoughts and feelings into marks of paper which other brains can interpret. It appears to me that the tendency of mind to infiltrate and control matter is a law of nature. Mind is patient. Mind has waited for three billion years on this planet before composing its first string quartet. It may have to wait for another three billion years on this planet before it spreads all over the galaxy. Ultimately, late or soon, mind will come into its heritage. This is from Freeman's book, Infinite in All Direction. And uh, I believe Freeman still believes in what he wrote at that time over there. Very good. It's one of the really very inspiring things. Uh, my next quote is from, uh, also from Freeman. Yeah, this is uh, Freeman uh, talks about mathematical physics, which my talk is going to be devoted to. It says, uh, this is from his book, uh, later book, uh, Eros and Gaia. To make clear the real and lasting importance of unfashionable science, I return to the field in which I'm an expert, namely mathematical physics. Mathematical physics is a discipline of people who try to reach a deep understanding of physical phenomena following the rigorous style and method of mathematics. It is a discipline that lies at the border between physics and mathematics. The purpose of mathematical physics is not to calculate phenomena quantitatively, but to understand them qualitatively. They work with theorems and proofs, not with numbers and computers. Their aim is to qualify with mathematical precision the concept upon which physical theories are built. Of course, Freeman is very good also in terms of doing quantitatively, even though he doesn't use any computers as we, as we heard before. But uh, my talk is going to be focused on the, what's the definition of mathematical physics uh, over here. I could go on quoting quite a lot more from Freeman, but uh, I think I will go on uh, to uh, kind of, uh, of really my talk and talk about the general background uh, about the relation between the microscopic world of atoms and the macroscopic world of ordinary matter. This is the subject of statistical mechanics to which Freeman has made seminal contributions. Uh, I will then focus more particularly on those parts of Freeman's work in statistical mechanics, mathematical physics, which have directly influenced my own work, including at the very end, some work which I was privileged to do jointly with Freeman. So, um, in fact, I chose this title, uh, Stability and Variability, both because it fits in what I'm going to talk about. Stability, as you will see, corresponds to stability of ordinary matter against collapse. Uh, and in fact, uh, if one needed any motivation for going beyond what is uh, one usually considers, namely uh, simple atoms like hard spheres or interacting uh, with Leonard Jones potential, uh, it was amply shown by the previous speaker that one really has to go, go into the guts to consider the electrons and nuclei, and that's where the stability of matter, which Freeman worked on, uh, comes in. So uh, let me go to the next talk, to the next, still the preliminaries. So as Freeman said in infinite in all direction, nature has a hierarchical structure with time lengths and energy scales, ranging from the submicroscopic to supergalactic. Surprisingly, it is possible, emphasized by Freeman, in many cases, essential to discuss these levels independently. Like he was saying before, chemistry is not easily reducible to physics. The same way, quarks are irrelevant for understanding protein folding, and uh, atoms are a distraction when studying tsunamis. Nevertheless, it has been a widespread dogma of science, very successful in the past 400 years, that there are no 
no new fundamental laws, only new phenomena as one goes up the hierarchy. Explanations are therefore always looked for in the smaller scales. Whether this paradigm will continue to hold as we try to fit general relativity with elementary particle physics or even put mental states of consciousness into the framework of our current physical theories seems to me still a mystery. But uh, as noted by our chair uh, Ed Witten in some relevant discussion, as he said, how will we know except by trying? <laughs> so I think, uh, so we have to try. Be that as it may, this reductionism is certainly applicable when it comes to describing properties of inanimate objects in terms of electron and nuclei. This is a subject of Cisco mechanics, which provides a framework for relating mesoscopic and macroscopic thermal phenomena to the microscopic world of atoms and molecules. Fortunately, many striking features of macroscopic systems, such as uh, abrupt change of properties for substance at the phase transition, like boiling and freezing of matter, can be obtained from simplified microscopic models. This is, of course, no longer true when you come to several hundred atmospheres of pressure, as we heard before. The simple models certainly do not work. But for many purposes, they work remarkably well. In fact, statistical mechanics often takes at the lowest level, starting point, Feynman's description of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling from being squeezed into one another. Sometimes even use crudel models, such as particles on a lattice. And that works very well in many cases. And the reason why such crude models work so very well, and again, always in some cases, they don't work well for the kind of phase diagrams described in the previous talk, lies in the large disparity in the spatial and temporal scales between the world of atoms and the world of microscopic objects. This not only necessitates a statistical theory which ignores many details, but also assures an analogy to the law of large numbers in probability theory that such a theory will give predictions precise enough to have the force of law, as in the second law of thermodynamics. The entropy of an isolated macroscopic system never decreases. Statistical mechanics aims to explain how the cooperative behavior of many individual entities can give rise to new phenomena, having no counterpart in the properties or dynamics of the separate entities. Uh, the nature of these entities can vary widely. In the traditional studies, there are atoms in a fluid, spin in a magnet, electrons in a metal, in more recent application, it can also be birds in a flock, people in a soccer stadium, or at a demonstration. And what I mean, for example, when you have a phase transition, like boiling of water, the atoms do not change at all. There is not the H2O, which is in the liquid, is exactly the same H2O that you get in the vapor. It's really uh, emergent cooperative phenomena, which, uh, occurs because you have so many different things of it. In uh, the 20th century, so the development of the subject of statistical mechanics into a physically very successful and very mathematically very beautiful theory of systems and thermal equilibrium. Freeman's work played an essential role in this achievement. The development of a comparable theory for the more complex world of non-equilibrium phenomena, ranging from heat conduction in metals to transport on living cell, remains a challenge. Uh, again, Freeman, it will soon be 90, he can start all over again and teach us something about non-equilibrium <laughs> phenomena. Anyway, stability of matter. So my first direct contact with Freeman's scientific work came in 1968 when I was working with Elliot Leaf on showing in a mathematical physics sense, like, a, like I described, Freeman says what mathematical physics is, 
So statistical mechanics can provide a basis for the equilibrium thermodynamics of real matter, consisting of electrons and nuclei interacting via Coulomb forces. And this, of course, as you saw, is very crucial. I mean, when you talk about water boiling or freezing, you can think of uh, the molecules as being the fundamental entities in many ways. But when you talk about high pressure and high temperature, or that is no longer possible. You have to deal with uh, the fact that real matter consists of electrons and nuclei interacting via Coulomb force. A very crucial ingredient in our analysis was Dyson's proof with Andrew Lennart of the stability against collapse of macroscopic Coulomb systems. To quote from 1968 paper with Leib, the dyson lennart theorem is as fundamental as it is difficult. In fact, I think at some point uh, Leib said it's the most, uh, up to that time, the most technical, difficult construction in mathematical physics and statistical mechanics. Uh, and before going on specifics of that problem, I want to give you a, a really bird's eye view how statistical mechanics of equilibrium system connects the microscopic with the macroscopic. So skipping many steps. For a multi-species system of N, N underlined means that you have many species uh, of particles in a region V with a microscopic effective Hamiltonian H, which consists of a kinetic energy plus potential energy, which is a system is in equilibrium at temperature T. Uh, we write sometimes as beta to one over beta. We define the canonical partition function of a quantum system as, uh, uh, as a sum over all energy levels, exponential minus beta to the E alpha, uh, where these are E alpha are the energy levels of the Hamiltonian H kinetic plus potential energy. For clad circle systems, this sum over energy levels is replaced up to some constants by an integral of exponential minus beta, the potential energy U, which depends on the coordinates of all the different particles over the configuration of system, which we denote by X sub N. So, uh, uh, next. We consider no sequences of domains, Vj, j equals one, two, such that as j increases, in fact, the volume of Vj going to infinity, I will not make a distinction between the domain Vj or the, its volume, the number of particles goes to infinity, but the ratio, because it should be underlined, should be a vector, rho, uh, so we consider such a sequence. Then taking the j infinity limit of this sequence, f sub j, which is the log of this partition function I described before, divided by the volume, we take the limit of that, and that goes to some function f of beta rho, which we identify with the Helmholtz free energy of the macroscopic system. So the connection between the microscopic in the macroscopic and statistical mechanics, Z is defined in terms of the microscopic Hamiltonian of the system, is then uh, taking the logarithm of that, dividing by the volume, and taking a limit, we get something which we identify with the bulk uh, Helmholtz free energy macroscopic quantity of uh, a thermodynamic system. In order for this to make sense, one has to show that you can use for the potential energy uh, or for the Hamiltonian, a realistic effective Hamiltonian describing macroscopic matter such that the limit exists and has the right convexity properties required of a thermodynamic free energy of a homogeneous system. So that is sort of the crucial ingredient in statistical mechanics of going from the microscopic to the macroscopic over there. Namely, you consider a sequence of domains, you take the, the free energy to unit volume, and then you let uh, the volume go to infinity, the number of particles go to infinity, 
in uh, assuming the limit exists and has the right properties, you have gone from a microscopic Hamiltonian to a macroscopic free energy of the system. So this requires, of course, oh, uh, before doing that, I should note here a quote from Ansager, relevant means so-called thermodynamic limit, but I wrote just before J going to infinity. The notion of a homogeneous thermodynamic system is valid for systems large compared to the size of molecules and small compared to the size of the moon. What does Ansager mean by this? Of course, real systems are not infinite. However, the right idealization for a system consisting of 10 to the 23 or so number of particles, it takes the infinite limit, but at the same time, you leave, you leave all the gravitational forces. Because if you include gravitational forces, you don't have a homogeneous system. Putting two suns together doesn't get you just a homogeneous sun of double the size. It's very different. So uh, thermodynamic limit is important. Now, by mid-60s, many authors, particularly Fisher and Duell, had developed techniques for establishing the existence and properties of the thermodynamic limit when the interaction potential U satisfies two criteria. One is H stability, which means that if you look any configuration of the particles uh, of, the, of these N, uh, of all the particles with the different species, then you always have a lower bound which is proportional to the total number, n is just the total number of particles. Quantum mechanically, it's that the ground state energy is bigger than minus bn. Namely, you have to have a lower bound. Uh, uh, so it's important to say that uh, the ground state of the quantum system has a lower bound by this. In the other criterion is called tempering where there is a typo there. The interaction between two sets of particles separated by distance r should be is bounded above by the distance to the minus the dimension plus epsilon. So uh, namely, uh, the decay, uh, if the interaction between particles has to decay at least as fast as one over the distance raised to the dimension of power. Uh, in fact, this is only important sort of for the positive part of the interaction. The negative part of the interaction are taken care of by these criteria. If they are very, if they don't decay slowly enough at large distances, the negative part, then this will never be satisfied uh, over there. Now, it was further known that these conditions hold where U is effective potential between neutral atoms and molecules such as Leonard-Jones pair potential. But clear, ne clearly, neither A nor B is satisfied for a classical system containing both positive and negative charges, E alpha, interacting via Coulomb pair potential, which it goes like Ri minus Rj to the distance minus D to the two. This, is, this interaction is unbounded by low E for two particles that don't have any lower bound. Uh, at short distances, and certainly it decays too slowly at long distances. As I just mentioned, why only talk about Coulomb interaction? After all, they're a nuclear interaction in all things. But the fact is that for macroscopic matter, even at these very high pressures discussed in the previous talk, the energy scales are such uh, that the nuclear forces don't really uh, come into play. It's really the Coulomb forces that are the dominant players over there. So, so the real problem at the time, in the 60s, uh, was to prove that uh, systems interacting with Coulomb interactions, quantum systems in particular, uh, have a lower bound, so-called H stability. Uh, I think the first one to realize the importance of this was again Lars Ansager. He proved in 1939 for systems which have an addition to Coulomb interaction, also hardcore interactions between the particles, that such systems 
R and Ds satisfy uh, age stability. Uh, actually, this is very uh, beautiful argument, like many of last arguments. If you have hard cores, then you can imagine, uh, according to Newton, that the charge is uniformly smeared out inside each hard core, since the interaction is the same as if it was a point charge. But if you have the charge uniformly smeared out, then you have the total energy is essentially the integral of the electric field squared minus the self energies coming from the particles. But since they have a finite diameter, the self energy is finite, and you have n particles, therefore you have a lower bound, and you can prove age stability for Coulomb systems with hard cores. But real systems do not have hard cores. And so there was a problem of proving age stability for quantum systems. Unlike classical systems, quantum systems do have a lower bound on the growth, ground state energy for finite n. If you have one proton and one electron, well, classically, the energy is not bounded below. Quantum mechanically, it is. It's minus 13 and a half electron volts. So the, the same is true for any n. The problem was, how does that lower bound scale with n? Does it indeed scale with n uh, linear in n, which is necessary for thermodynamic stability? Here is where the heroic efforts of Dyson and Lahr came in. They proved that if either the negative or positive charge species were all fermions, then the quantum many body system is H stable. This is the same as Dyson Lennart theory. Dyson later showed that having fermions, which electrons are, the neg which happens, so that is not only sufficient but also necessary. Uh, because if you have only bosons, then, in fact, it goes down much too fast, like n to the seven fifth, and such a system would not be stable. I remember giving a talk a long time ago with Wigner there, saying, ah, ah, that's why we don't have matter made up just of pion, of boson pions over there, because it would not be stable at all. Using the Dyson Lennart theorem of age stability, Elliot and I overcame the problem of slow decay by making use of the tendency of Coulomb systems to shield bare charges. Namely, if there's a bare charge, then uh, Coulomb systems have the property that the opposite charge will come and surround it and shield it. So the detective interaction is not the bare Coulomb interaction, but some kind of detective screened interaction over there. This proves the existence and convexity of this free energy for neutral Coulomb systems, where the net charge is zero, and is the limiting density. In the sum here is over all species. The situation is quite different when the system does have a net charge. What happens then is that the excess charge Qj goes to the surface of the region. The free energy Vj then depends on the amount of charge per surface area, Sj of Vj. With, uh, Fj with the free energy increasing with Qj and going to infinity when the amount of charge per surface area goes to infinity. This means that there is a strong inhibition against large charge fluctuation in Coulomb systems. In fact, if one considers the grand canonical ensemble for Coulomb systems, if one does not fix the particle number or the charges, then the thermodynamic quantities are the same as if one only considered the restrict, a restricted grand canonical ensemble made of neutral systems, which have charge zero. If you look at the unrestricted ensemble, you have the average charge per volume goes to zero, and also the variance of the charge divided by the volume goes to zero, which means that there is a strong inhibition against charge fluctuations. I mean, this means that there would be regions with much larger charge positive or negative. And then we can also ask this question of fluctuations in a different way. Suppose we have a very large neutral system in a domain V. In fact, we will usually take V to be infinite. Then what are the charge fluctuations in a subdomain uh, lambda in V? And I will now consider this question 
as well as similar fluctuations in eigenvalue distribution of random matrices, which Dyson brilliantly connected with Coulomb system. I guess you already heard uh, some of this this morning from the talk by Yo. So that put me to consider now, so I've discussed stability, now I'll discuss variability. To fluctuate is normal, and in most cases, fluctuations are themselves normal. By which I mean that I scale like the square root of typical values as an Epsilon process. There are, however, many very interesting exceptions where the fluctuations are subnormal. They don't grow like the volume. These range from charge fluctuation in Coulomb systems to energy fluctuations in the early universe. Uh, I'll mention that uh, briefly later, uh, but not coming too much on it. I will now describe some exact results for such systems, many related in one way or another to the work done or inspired uh, by Freeman. To make things simple, I will only consider systems one, one type of particles. So for Coulomb systems, I will consider only the one component plasma or jelly model introduced by Wigner in the 30s. In this system, positive point charges are immersed in a uniform continuum neutralizing negative background. So fluctuations in particle number are the same as fluctuations in charge. But the results actually extend to charge fluctuations in multi-component system. Uh, consider particles in, in B dimensions with a translation invariant measure mu on configuration. I guess there's no way of, of shifting this. Configuration that describes the, the, the positions of the different particles. Let n lambda x be the number of particles in a region lambda in Rd with volume lambda. It's the average number of particles, and then given with a system with density rho by n lambda equals rho lambda, and the variance will in general scale like lambda to some power uh, alpha uh, over there. Uh, maybe sometimes there will also be logarithmic corrections to that. So alpha is one, that's normal. Always true for short range interactions at high temperature. You always have that the variance in number of particles in a region lambda scales like the size of the region. This can be proven vigorously. Uh, alpha greater than one is a critical point where fluctuations grow faster <coughs> than the volume, so it actually diverges. In alpha less than one are Coulomb systems, eigenvalues of Gaussian random matrices, some cosmology, some lattice point, etc., which I will uh, discuss now. Uh, the variance mu lambda is expressible just in terms of the pair correlation function of the system. So, uh, so G is uh, G is defined as expectation value uh, of the delta function. Uh, R at R1, summing over all particles I, and at uh, uh, position R2, summing over all J, minus rho square. And so this is just an identity that you can write the variance in that one. We are talking about a homogeneous system. And um, uh, so uh, this can be rewritten as a, something proportional to lambda, take the G of R, the G of R you know, corresponds to the infinite system, the R minus some part which uh, accounts for the, uh, what happens, uh, the finiteness of the system. Uh, uh, I guess I'm not going to go into details. But the important part is, if you take the volume lambda and expand it some similar way, then this term alpha lambda will grow like the surface area. Uh, in one dimension, surface area is just equal to two. And then averaging over rotations, you can write uh, I mean, uh, this alpha lambda over the surface area of the main lambda approaches, approaches something like some constant times absolute value of R. 
So the point is the following. Uh, if we uh, go back one slide, so that we have for the fluctuations, we divide the variance by lambda, we will have one term like this and another term, one over lambda uh, over here. And so the first term, we say, will be a, a bulk term, which is given by this, and for critical system is infinite, and we are interested in cases of subnormal fluctuations, where the term, uh, the fluctuation, or the variance divided by the volume goes to zero as the size of the domain uh, uh, goes to infinity. And we, what are examples? So one component system, the spare interaction, and uniform charge background density row, then general mu lambda will go like the surface area. In fact, for a one-dimensional system, phi of r grows like minus r, and then we have bounded variance, because the surface is just finite for a one-dimensional system, and we have, therefore, a Wigner crystal at all temperature, meaning that the thermodynamic equilibrium state of a one-dimensional gelium or one-component uh, plasma is a crystalline structure. And this various people have contributed to that. I think most recently, Sabine Johnson, Paul Jung have done it. So in one dimension, you really have at all temperatures, both classically and quantum mechanically, uh, you have uh, bounded variance. As, as you increase your domain size, you do not increase the variance at all. It goes really to finite limits. This is not true in higher dimensions, at least not at high temperatures. One can prove that Coulomb systems have good decay of correlations, exponential decay classically with hard cores, and poor law decay R minus six quantum mechanical in D equals three. The reason for the slower quantum decay is that quantum fluctuations interfere with the shielding that's exerted by. And the R minus six is related to the Van der Waals Van der Waals between atoms uh, over there. In two dimension, then the interaction between two uh, charged particles and uniform background, forgetting about the background, is minus log of R. You have a surface area, but you expect a Wigner crystal at low temperature. But an uh, interesting part there, there's an exact solution for the distribution of particles of the one component plasma at one particular value, beta e squared over two. This distribution is uh, isomorphic to the distribution of zeros for Gaussian matrices without symmetry. This was shown by Geneva and then developed by Giancovici. Uh, Gaussian matrices without symmetry, you don't require them to be Hermitian or anything like that. All you say, each element of the matrix, both the real and the imaginary part, are IID, Gaussian random variable. And in that case, uh, it turns out, if you uh, look at the distribution of eigenvalues in the complex plane, and you scale that the density properly, it's exactly the same as what you have for Coulomb systems uh, at this particular value of the temperature, beta e squared. In three dimensions, uh, you get uh, just uh, that it, it grows like the surface area at least at not too low temperatures. Now, an interesting case are Coulomb systems in D dimension with D plus one dimensional interactions, like particles on a line with logarithmic interaction. This corresponds, as shown by Dyson, to suitably normalize a density row eigenvalue distribution of random Gaussian matrices with a symmetry for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, Gaussian unitary ensemble, and Gaussian symmetric ensemble. We then have for the variance, the number of eigenvalues and interval of lengths L grows like log of L. So it doesn't grow like L. Uh, it grows uh, like uh, log of L over there. Unlike the case if the particles interacted uh, really with one dimension of Coulomb things. And we said the variance would be bounded. Here the variance is not bounded, but it does not grow as fast uh, as a, a domain. 
Interestingly, in all the quorum cases considered above, the deviation from the average divided by square root of the variance gives a Gaussian standard Gaussian random variable. This was proven for the eigenvalue distribution of the interval by Kosten and myself when it, with an assist from Dyson. With one of the many assists Dyson has given us. I mean, we, we proved this for the unitary, Gaussian unitary ensemble, and then didn't know how to do it for the Gaussian orthogonal or symplectic ensembles. And Dyson pointed out a paper which shows that there is an interlacing of eigenvalues between these different type of assembles, which enabled us to finish the proof. Now here, uh, I don't know much about it, but my what the current status of this is. But apparently, uh, there is an argument by Harrison and by Zeldovich separately that at some point in the initial universe, matter or energy density was distributed more uniformly that it would be for a Poisson distribution. So the fact that the quantity, which I called B before, uh, would go to zero. And so uh, people have tried to make simulations of the development of galaxies starting from some such, we call it super homogeneous uh, initial conditions. But uh, I do not know what the status of that theory is at the present time. Maybe we will hear about it tomorrow, maybe not. So, uh, okay, now here's the question. Now, say when the bulk term goes to zero, we still have a surface term, which is the variance divided by the surface area. And the question is, and this could be infinite, like in the case we just discussed before, for uh, a one-dimensional system with logarithmic in, uh, interaction, uh, surface area is constant, but uh, the variances grow like a uh, log of the thing. And the question is, is, uh, is there also possibilities this can be zero? And the answer, interesting answer by Joseph Beck, my colleague is no, if the distribution is rotational invariant or lambda is a sphere. It's still an open question how small kappa can be, and there it attains its minimum volume. For what kind? Oh, here, uh, let me uh, do something slightly different. Ed, what is the time? So uh, I consider the case, you no, know, where we have particles in a dis in two dimension, uh, a two dimensional one component plasma with uh, uniform density rho equals one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, it turns out uh, that for this case, the large deviation, namely having the deviation from the average number of particles, which pi r squared, which normally would scale like r squared, scales quite differently uh, uh, over there. In fact, uh, there's a great suppression of possible variances. Uh, in fact, this is, this, this is the same for the distribution at beta equals two, which is the same as the eigenvalues of random matrices with independent complex entries. It also turns out, and this, I don't understand it, but really very interesting, that so-called Gaussian entire function, namely it takes the function f of z, there's this coefficient zeta k are real Gaussian, no, sorry, not real, Gaussian I and D, complex random variables. And then for this one, the large deviation formula written down before was proven not so long ago by Nazarov, Soden, uh, and Volga, that you have there. Uh, okay, let me come on now to the sort of last part of my talk, which involves actually some work which I was involved together with Dyson. So this goes back to something called the ghost problem in number theory. Consider just the two-dimensional square lattice and take a circle with radius r centered at the origin. Then goes as the question, find a bone on the difference between the actual number of lattice points inside 
<laughs> of radius r minus average value pi r squared. And Gauss proved that 1788, uh, so he wanted a bound of the forum uh, r to the gamma plus epsilon. And the question is, what is gamma? Now, Gauss proved it's, uh, that uh, gamma equals 1 satisfies the criterion, but it's not the best one. And uh, over the years, there have been many incremental improvements, uh, many of them by number theorists. I mean, I think there are at least a dozen successively better values than one. It's the best one, as far as I know, uh, is uh, 131 over 208, which claims in 203. I mean, Hardy made the conjectures. So it probably is the correct answer is gamma a half. And probably, uh, in effect, you have to add some logarithmic term, uh, uh, not even with epsilon, just some logarithmic term. But the, oh yeah, I say this has some relation to the distribution of eigenvalues of a particle, the unit torus. In the early 90s, Pavel Blecher, Jemming Cheng, Freeman, Dyson, and I considered the following more general problem. Let A be a point in the unit squared and define then the number of lattice points such that n minus A is less than R. Uh, how many lattice? So the ghost problem would correspond to A equals zero, but it's, you can ask the question in general. So far, there is no randomness. From the point of view of energy level, Statistics bear interest in the behavior of this quantity F A of R, N A of R minus pi R squared or the square root of R. The energy or R varies over some range over there. The following ideas of his broom, Blecher, Cheng, Dyson, and myself, prove the following theorem. The probability is that F of alpha of R, A of R, lies between some value X and X plus dx approaches as, uh, if you take an average, or you look at, or you make it um, R varying uniformly between one and T, and you look at the fraction of values where you get, you know, where F alpha lies in a given range, this goes as E to the minus X four, definitely non-Gaussian uh, at all. It was first shown by Blacher and Dyson that this P a of x is a very singular function of the point you choose. In fact, they show that the second moment has a sharp local maximum at every rational point of a. Really quite remarkable. And then uh, I'll just show you. Oh, this is just the actual numerics. If you compute uh, the number of points within uh, number of lattice points, uh, which are within a circle of radius r minus pi r squared. So it's, this is purely deterministic for a equals zero, but you see but how it's very, very, very random. Uh, let me skip the next few slides. This just shows you uh, some more uh, how it looks like for the, the actual distribution p a of x, how it looks like. So let me skip that. So I will end my talk. I wanted to end it with a quote from Schrodinger which I believe expresses ideas similar to those of Freeman. I'm not sure. Right there. I am born into an environment I, kn I know not whence I came, nor whither I go, nor who I am. This is my situation as yours, every single one of you. The fact that everyone always was in the same situation and always will be tells me nothing. Or burning question as to whence and whither, all we can or self-subserves about it is the present environment. That is why we are eager to find out about it as much as we can. That is science, learning, knowledge. This is the true source of every spiritual endeavor of man. So just one final picture of Freeman in a rather jovial mood. <laughs> as you can see, Freeman has a yarmulke. In, uh, here it says chief. For me also, it says chief, and this poor lady, who I don't know, uh, says Indian. So it's a game of Shalai, which was apparently uh, 
at the wedding of Pavel Becher's daughter, Nadia. So, <laughs> very enjoyable to have had all this interaction with Freeman over the years. Thank you very much.